Hi folks, Triss here. Big news, Modern Prometheus returns to Dragon Meet, a huge tabletop convention here in London on Saturday the 2nd of December, in less than two weeks' time. Come look for us in the lower hall and grab a copy of our latest RPG. I'll also be bringing snacks. Thanks for listening to Modern Prometheus, and thanks especially to all of you who have joined our Patreon. We don't run ads, so the whole podcast is supported by you. If you'd like to help out, head over to patreon.com forward slash Modern Prometheus. Members get free merch, early access, bonus episodes, and a lot more exciting stuff. Today's story is called 1.48am, and is about what comes next. Adebayo has never believed in ghosts which you would think would be an issue for someone making a living as an exorcist. Not so. It's remarkably easy to get rid of something that was never there in the first place. The Morley family, in whose living room Ade is currently placing cleansing cedar incense, very much do believe in ghosts. Ade has invested a considerable amount of time recently, making sure this is the case. He started small, breaking in at two in the morning and rearranging items in their living room. Batteries replaced with dead ones. The flowers in the vase on the kitchen table swapped for rotten stems. He spent a couple of nights on this before ramping things up to knocking pictures off the wall and scrawling GET OUT across it in charcoal. He doesn't like doing this. No, that's a lie. He enjoys it. He enjoys the trick, the construction. It makes him feel like a magician for people who don't know they're an audience. And it could be worse. He could have a nine to five. But he doesn't want to do it. It's dangerous and a lot of work for a 500 pound fee. Often he doesn't need to. Arde may not believe in ghosts, but there are plenty of people who do and enough of those people have just moved into a house where the creaks don't seem quite right to keep him in business. He is a purveyor of the world's finest placebos, and he is good at it. But sometimes the business isn't there. His flyers, get your life back from ghosts, don't catch the fish, but Arde still has rent to pay. For these times, he has his lockpicks and a taste for drama. Mr. Morley looks in awe of Arde's swinging gold chain and his red robe embroidered with tribal designs. Arde doesn't know which tribe it is. He bought it off Etsy from someone who claimed it was handmade but was obviously drop shipping from somewhere in Vietnam. Is this an old ritual? He asks. Very old. Arde says, channeling an accent that was originally his grandfather's but has drifted to several places since. I learn it from me murder, who learn it from he murder, who learn it from he father, who he learn it from, who knows. And he flashes a set of brilliant white teeth, cold as a searchlight. As long as it works, says Mrs. Morley. It's been awful. It will work, says Arde. Trust me. The preachers here, they do not understand demons. Where I come from, we understand. This work. This always work. And he begins to chant. He starts off with a few syllables like wum, ba, and way throws in a few Hausa and Igbo words he got off YouTube, then starts swinging his chain and yells, Be gone! loudly several times. Finally, he raises a finger. Do you feel that? The family look at him expectantly. Is gone. He takes their thanks and their money, agrees with Mrs. Morley, saying how she definitely felt something when the demon was banished, and reminds them if the demon does return, he will perform the exorcism again for no charge. It will be an easy guarantee to keep, as Ade has already been scouting possible places in a new neighbourhood. You never hit the same area twice in quick succession. He returns home, pinging his landlord a message on the way that he has the rent ready. When he gets in, he thinks his landlord has turned up already, 
as he can see someone sat at the living room table. But it's not his landlord. It's a woman, young, early twenties, he'd guess, with messy brown hair, other features he has trouble making out. Who are you? He asks. How did you get in? I need you to do an exorcism, the woman says. Oh, Ade almost puts on the accent again, but remembers just in time that it's too late for that. He still isn't sure how the woman got in, but he's not one to look a gift mark in the mouth. Okay, then. What needs to be exercised? The woman gets up and walks through the table. Me. Why not? The woman says. Her name, Arde has established, is Emily, and her voice gains static when she gets angry. The words leaving him feel like someone's running fingernails down a tuned-out television screen. Because I'm not an exorcist, Arde says, for what he feels like is the thousandth time. I just buy weird incense. You have leaflets that say exorcist on them? Emily holds out a hand, and one of the offending purple flyers flaps across the room to hang in the air between them. They do not, in fact, say exorcist on them. They say, exercise and cleanse your home with ancient secrets of Yoruba magic. But Ade doesn't think it's worth arguing the point. But that's not what I do. So it's a lie? It's marketing, Ade snaps. There's a difference. He shakes his head. Part of him, the part which has always sat watching the rest of him live life and heckled from the gallery, is quietly impressed how smoothly he's gone from not believing in ghosts to arguing with one in his kitchen. It's hard to hold on to an idea when faced with living, as it were, proof to the contrary. Why do you even want to be exercised? The leaflet flutters to the floor and Emily says, far quieter. I don't want to be here anymore. Why not? Because I don't. Because I'm done. Why does it matter? Why do you care? I just need you to do the job. I keep telling you. I know you do. I don't believe you. Arde looks at her for a solid minute, then throws up his hands. It doesn't matter. I'm not doing it. Emily growls through static. Then I hope. Arde remembers when he would pride himself on a subtle, professional haunting. The kind that would leave the family wondering if there was something wrong or if they were going mad until it slowly, steadily ramped up to a climax. Emily does not do subtle. He goes out to sit in a cafe in Teverham, checking out the neighbourhood while flicking through the recently sold properties in the area on Rightmove. New owners are always his best market. When he comes home, he finds all the cupboards open and a pile of cutlery stuffed in the microwave, which switches on the instant he comes in. He is woken by a crash to find every clock in his flat flushing at 1.47am. He sees her out of the corner of his eye, catches her standing behind him in a mirror. And that shouldn't work. That kind of technique should play on the uncertainty of feeling like someone is there, but knowing you're alone. But Ade isn't alone. He knows she's here. Still, he jumps whenever he sees her figure in a doorway, messy hair over her face, staring at the floor. He wakes again at 1.47am, feeling like something big is watching him. The television can no longer find a channel, and is tuned to screaming static. His phone buzzes with a WhatsApp message from an unknown number, showing a photo of him sleeping and some dark shape bending over him. He cannot sleep at all. He's tired, so tired, but his eyes refuse to shut for more than a few seconds. He lays there in a suspiciously quiet flat, 
until at 1.47 a.m. every picture, every book, every shelf falls from his walls. Finally, he sits bolt upright and glares at the empty room. Fine! He says, they'll do your damn exorcism. He starts with the classics. The bell, the book and the candle. He finds a bell in a junk shop. One that looks like a town crier once used it to warn about invading Spaniards. He buys a Bible in a charity bookshop, and four candles which claim to be infused with the cleansing energy of bergamot, from a shop which smells like someone steam-cleaned a lavender bush. Ade doesn't have much truck with cleansing energy either, but at this point he's happy to tick every box going. He places the candles in a ring on the living room floor. In fairness, they do smell nice. His phone rings and answers itself. Emily. She tries to avoid manifesting, he's noticed. Should I be in the middle of them or something? Can't hurt, Arde says. Doubt it matters, though. Don't think this was designed with ghosts being compliant in mind? You ready? Okay, Emily says through his speakerphone. Let's go. So, Arde rings the bell, places his hand on the Bible, and commands Emily to leave, just like he saw in The Exorcist. He finishes, and there is silence. Did it work? He asks. His phone responds with a curt, No! and hangs up. That night, he is woken at 1.47am, with the feeling of fingers slowly sliding over his throat. God damn it, he says. I said I'd try something else, didn't I? His phone rings, answers itself. I can't help it. Just being here, in this world, I feel like I'm boiling over. I can't hold it in. And eventually, it all comes out. At 1.47 in the goddamn morning, Arde mutters. The hell is it with you at 1.47am anyway? Shift it on a few hours and you could be my damn alarm clock. At least that'd be useful. His phone murmurs. That's when I died. Oh. Uh. Sorry. I feel like a jerk now. You couldn't know. How, uh... How long has it been? His phone says... Too long. And hangs up. The next day, he finds an article by Eliza Delacour about exorcism practices in ancient Egypt, which involved requesting help from the god whose demonic side had caused the possession. Ade isn't sure which god might have sent him Emily, so he makes an impassioned plea to all of them. The gods, and therefore Emily, remain unmoved. He wakes at 1.47am to the sound of footsteps walking closer and closer to his bedroom door, echoing far more than they really should. His door swings open and for a moment he thinks he sees the shadow of a person, but no one is there. He finds a post on Tumblr that says, TikTok witch cleansing a house. Take precisely 30 grams of rosemary and place it in a circle inscribed with other sigils and burn the offering at the stroke of midnight on the night of the waxing gibbous moon while intoning the Maja Diad. Actual witch cleansing a house. Bang saucepans together while marching from room to room. Get out, you bastard! Get out, you bastard! Get out, you bastard! He tries them both. Both fail. He wakes again at 1.47am to find every electrical appliance in the flat flickering on and off. This time, he calls Emily's number. It comes up as unrecognised, but he says, don't give me that, and tries again. This time, she picks up. What's going to happen? he asks. When we get this right and you finally leave me the hell alone, what's going to happen to you? She doesn't answer for a while, then says, I don't know. You don't know? Did I stutter? Emily snaps. Just seems extreme. 
I've been reading stuff that says you'll be sent to hell. I don't think there's a hell. I think maybe I just stop. Maybe I get to go where everyone else goes. Maybe I can leave. Why do you want to leave? This place so bad? Arde's backseat driver is yelling at him to stop talking in case she does decide to stay. But the voice on the other end of the phone sounds broken and he can't let it go. I spent so long, Emily says. When I died, I could have gone. I could have gone where everyone else goes. But I was so angry, I didn't. I refused, I stayed, and I spent years working out what I was going to do. How I was going to confront the man who killed me. And I had a plan. A plan. And I thought when I'd done that, I could go, I'd be done. But then I did it. And it didn't go. I thought it would. So now I'm stuck. I'm cold. And I'm tired. And I'm stuck. And I have nothing left here. And I want to leave. She hangs up. So the next day, Ade goes to the Moonstar Cafe, where the guy is eating an egg and bacon roll and reading a book written in scratches. I need an exorcism ritual that works, Arde says. I know, the guy replies. It will cost you £10,000. Arde attempts to process that, fails, and tries again. That's... that's... that's a lot, he says. Correct, says the guy, not looking up from his book. I thought you charged in secrets and friendship and stuff like that. I do sometimes. My prices are fluid, but they are always something the buyer values highly. If there is no value in what is given, there can be no value in what is taken. The guy turns his magpie blue eyes on Arde. And we both know there's only one thing you value. I don't have that much money. The guy shrugs. That doesn't sound like a problem he needs to solve. Best find it then. Teverham isn't a neighbourhood where people have a lot of money. It's the haunt of first-time buyers, and monthly mortgage payments circle over the terraces like vultures. Ade wishes he had the money to live there. His phone buzzes with a message. You really don't know anything about exorcisms, do you? He responds. What was the first clue? The fact nothing has worked? Or maybe, maybe, was it how I said, over and over, that I know nothing about exorcisms. He goes back to right move. He'll leaflet the recent buys anyway, but he knows generating this amount of money is going to involve lockpicks. There's a checklist for a good mark. They should own, not rent. A tenant might get the landlord involved, and a landlord can have several houses. Running into one of those twice isn't a risk Ardo wants to take. Ideally, they're first-time buyers nervous over the biggest purchase of their life and kids he goes back and forth on the desirability of kids kids wake up in the night kids scream kids provoke unhelpful instincts in parents when an intruder is in the house but kids also mean the parents are more willing to try anything to make the weird shit stop the problem with this checklist is that People who tick all these boxes also tend to tick the one that says, no money. You can only scam people out of what they have. He's going to need to do 10 of these, maybe 20, before he has the guy's money. His phone buzzes. You should hit the docks. The docks are no longer docks. They used to be, many years ago. Now they are gated apartment blocks with concierges and a built-in gym. They're where people live when they move money for a living. Never going to get in there, Arde sends back. Too much security. 
You don't need to. A right move listing pings up on his phone. A palatial two-bed apartment on the eighth floor of a block. Asking price, 1.4 million. Give it a week and then get your leaflet through this door. Still, every night, our day is woken up at 1.47 a.m. The door is answered by a man younger than Ade, in tatty jeans and a black t-shirt with a picture of Elon Musk and a speech bubble reading, LOL. He has the kind of look that suggests he calls everyone bro, and bags under his eyes that suggest the only thing keeping him awake is cocaine. Ade lets the accent flow. You call for an exorcist. Oh, bro, yes. Come in. You want tea? Beer? A hooker? Seriously, bro. Anything. Ade is led into a minimalist front room the size of his entire flat. One chair is overturned. The ceiling is dripping something dark brown and leave is scrawled in huge letters on the wall. It's tenth hour, right? The bro says. You want half now? I can send it. It's right here. No need. You can send the payment in full when you satisfied the job is done. Now please, stand and bear witness. Ade sets up his incense, and as he does so, a cold wind begins to drift around the room. Does it know? The bro asks. Does it know what we're doing? It knows. That will not help. The wind whips higher and blows out one of the incense sticks. Ade slams his stick on the floor and snaps some syllables he thinks mean your cow is lost in Yoruba, and the wind dies down. He begins to chant and swing his gold chain. As he does so, the furniture rattles and everything electric flickers. He raises his voice and keeps chanting. In the centre of the circle, he sees Emily begin to manifest, hair over her face, glitching in and out of reality. As he reaches a climax, she leaps at him, screaming, but then she hits the circle boundary and it's like she dissolves and everything stops. The furniture stops rattling. The electric stops flickering. The leave vanishes from the wall, which Ado thinks is a nice touch. He turns to the bro. Your house is cleansed. He has a hard time holding in his excitement until he's back home, when he phones Emily. That was fun, she says. Fun? That was epic, he replies. So good. Did you see how fast he sent over that cash? And that thing where you just leapt at the circle edge? So good. That that was okay, Emily says. Okay. Okay, mate, you were fantastic. The phone is silent for a moment. What did you call me there? What? Mate. Sorry, I get it. This is just business. I didn't mean to be, like, familiar or whatever. No, it's just no one's ever called me that before. Mate? No one's ever called you mate? No, even when you were, you know, alive? I... I went early. Uh, you want to talk about it? Not yet. The phone hangs up. You know, he says to the empty air, we did pretty good there. We could do a bit more of it if you want. If you fancied hanging around. That might be cool. The air does not respond. That night, at 1.48am, Ade is still asleep. And the next day, Ade goes to see the guy, who gives him an exorcism ritual, and then leaves the £10,000 for the waitress as a tip. What do two empty beer bottles, a supermarket receipt, and a small amount of blood have in common? They are all required components of the exorcism ritual. There are more components. I will not tell you what they are. 
This is not for exercising your ghosts. Arde clears a space on his living room table, assembles the beer bottles, the receipt, and the rest. Ready? He asks. There is no answer. The phone hasn't picked up since yesterday. He begins to read the words and lights the solitary required candle which blows out. He stops. You okay? We good? We doing this? Silence. He relights the candle and begins again. The candle blows out and falls over. Okay, he says, what's up? I spent 10k on this, you don't want it. Emily manifests on the other side of the table. She looks nervous. She says, I do. But I thought maybe tomorrow. Ade barely has time to raise an eyebrow before Emily rushes on. It's just, I spent ages working on my big revenge plan, and it didn't work, but it's all I'd ever done. And I spent, I don't know how long, drifting and getting more and more frustrated, but then we did that thing yesterday, and it was really fun. And I still think I should go, of course I should go, but maybe I could live a little first? Ade smiles and gathers up the items. Yeah, he says. Tomorrow sounds good. And I mean, if we get to tomorrow and you think you haven't lived enough, then there's always another tomorrow, right? For the first time, he sees Emily smile. A fleeting thing quickly chased off her face when she realises it's visible. I'd... I'd like that. Murder in Prometheus is written by Neil Merton. The voice of the city is Kate Angier, with music and production by me, Tris Oten. For free merch, bonus episodes, and behind-the-scenes content, support us at patreon.com forward slash Prometheus. If you're not ready for that kind of commitment, please rate and review us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to this right now. It really does help. Our next story is due on the Moon of Lights, the 27th of December, when the feast is over, the guests have returned home, and there is nothing to do but wait out the long winter dark, which will surely, eventually, end. <laughs>